everyone. Uh, welcome everyone. Yeah, uh, welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, Simon, for the introduction. Um, I'll probably start sharing the presentation. Um, hope it's working. Uh, it's always nice to check. Uh, anyhow, my name is uh, Volodymyr Vysotsky. I'm an expert consultant on accessibility of built environment and a member of the International Association of Accessibility Professionals. I'm also a co-founder of a universal design studio called Orful, which operates in Kyiv and basically um, works with uh, designing and uh, consulting on the issues of accessibility, designing inclusive spaces. Um, we sometimes uh, engage in training uh, more often now than before. And obviously the issue of inclusion of uh, accessibility are of utmost importance for Ukraine and uh, definitely for other uh, countries of the Eastern Partnership. Um, we have many things in common, namely the post-socialist um, uh, inheritance, our cities, our um, institutions, buildings, and the overall infrastructure are um, or have been um, developed without uh, proper attention to accessibility and inclusion. And uh, the other point is that our societies undergo the process of social transformation, uh, where human rights and diversity become the um, most prominent values. And again, this also requires us as, uh, as nations, as societies, as communities, to ensure that everyone is um, given equal opportunities and uh, that every person, regardless of their health, regardless of their um, particular characteristics, is enabled to live a full uh, life independently, um, to be able to realize their own hopes, dreams, expectations, get education, to travel, so on and so forth. Um, so I'll be talking more about the uh, general concepts, a little bit about my project that I've been able to implement thanks to the uh, Eastern Partnership Fellowship Program, for which I'm thankful to the European Union and to the um, many opportunities that exist and that the European community creates for um, for everyone basically um, living nearby and in the countries that are neighboring countries for the EU. Um, this is very important because we uh, expect to become part of the Union at some point and uh, our cultural space um, is already um, common in many ways. But this needs to be um, developed, this needs to be enforced. So um, the process of integration requires us to uh, think about cultural integration as well. Um, I've already said that Ukraine faces many challenges in terms of developing um, the accessible environment, an environment which empowers and enables everyone. And uh, we are working uh, thoroughly to learn uh, from um, international experience, to uh, research um, best practices that exist in the world, and to try to adapt them to our particular conditions, to our particular infrastructure. Um, anyway, um, so yeah. uh, I would like to start by citing the um, United Nations Convention on the rights of persons with disabilities. Uh, it's Article 30. It's called Participation in Cultural Life, Recreation, Leisure, leisure and Sport. Um, here I would like to make one small remark that when we are talking about accessibility and inclusion, we often um, think that it's about engaging people with disabilities, but uh, um, the truth is that it's about engaging everyone regardless of their uh, disability or other um, characteristics. So, um, but of course, the convention is essential to um, to this particular group, and by 
creating a space, a world, a community that is uh, accessible to people with disabilities. We are, uh, of course, creating accessibility and inclusion for all. Uh, so the Article 30 um, states that people with disabilities have the right to take part on an equal basis with others in cultural life. Uh, it goes further to uh, bring in some details. Uh, and uh, basically, there's a, uh, there's, there are several elements to this participation, equal participation. And uh, it includes, but it is not limited to access to cultural materials in accessible formats, access to television programs, films, theater, other cultural activities, again, in accessible formats. Also, this implies access to places of um, to cultural venues, places uh, like theaters, uh, museums, cinemas, libraries, um, tourism attract tourist attractions, and basically um, places of significance um, in terms of history, in terms of local um, traditions. Um, so these are hundreds and probably thousands of places that should be made accessible to everyone. And uh, the last point I would like to make is that the convention seeks to enable persons with disabilities to have the opportunity to develop and utilize their creative, artistic, and intellectual potential. Uh, notably, it should be um, it should be carried out not just for their own benefit, but also for the enrichment of society. So again, we're talking about um, broader spheres than just this community of people with disabilities. We're talking about the society in general a society that enables and empowers everyone, uh, regardless of their um, particular characteristics. Um, inclusion, uh, again, I'm just expressing my point of view, and this comes from my personal experience um, working in the field for probably almost a, dec a decade. Um, so I've tried to kind of bring a little systematization to this issue in terms of culture and um, I've decided or I found that there are three key elements to inclusion. Um, I see inclusion as a process of involving or engaging everyone uh, into in this case cultural life and uh, there are three basic points or three fundamentals uh, that are necessary uh, to achieve this process of inclusion and to make it sustainable. Um, the first one is probably accessibility, which implies creating barrier-free spaces, uh, ensuring independent use, and providing multiple formats of uh, information, of experience, so that everyone can enjoy or um, take part in activities. And I'm sorry. And um, so that everybody is given equal rights and opportunities. The second issue is representation, which uh, implies mainstreaming diversity through various media, making it an integral part of social life so that um, people, uh, different people, including people with disabilities, are seen. And uh, this is very important in terms of normalization and destigmatization of disability in particular. And the third element is participation, which means uh, providing for sustainable and meaningful engagement uh, for every person, which again requires certain changes or shifts in uh, the way we organize events, in the way we organize education, or um, in the way we establish uh, art um, institutions, or create exhibitions, and so on. So all these three elements, accessibility, representation, and participation are equally important, and they should be developed in unison, uh, again, in a sustainable fashion. Um, we'll start with the accessibility, which implies, as I've mentioned, uh, the first element of accessibility is barrier-free um, access to venues, to um, the physical environment, and I've just I'm just providing several uh, examples of what it means to create barrier-free space. Of course, it means uh, ensuring that there is um, barrier-free um, 
environment to move around, to um, travel, preferably on foot. And uh, this means that we should make sure that our um, communities, our cities are pedestrian friendly and that they provide a level um, ground wherever it's possible. Uh, and where we have changes of level, we should ensure that we have uh, ramps and other, um, let's say, tools that uh, enable this equal access and that remove or eliminate barriers to people um, who use wheelchairs or people who use other um, mobility devices. Um, this also includes areas of historic um, historical areas, which are very common to Europe and common to Ukraine and common to Georgia, I guess. And often it is uh, thought that um, historic buildings or um, various castles, fortresses, um, even parts of cities that are that have been built hundreds of years ago cannot be made accessible. And that's uh, just not true. Uh, all it uh, needs is, um, again, a change of thinking, change of the way we um, organize these spaces today and with um, certain rather small uh, transformations, we can achieve uh, much better accessibility for um, everyone. Um, this is an example from Britain. And um, so nothing extraordinary is uh, required. It's all about thinking uh, of how can we make a particular space more uh, welcoming, more friendly uh, to everyone. Um, as I've already mentioned, ramps are also uh, very common, at least uh, in our context, where we have many buildings which have been built without any consideration for accessibility. But uh, all over the world, we can find such buildings. And what you need to do is construct an, an accessible ramp, which should comply to all the standards. And uh, there are, of course, international standards regarding accessibility. And of course, there are national regulations. So these should be uh, kept in mind. And it is very important to apply these regulations uh, in a proper fashion so that uh, the ramps or other, uh, let's say, improvements that we're doing are functional and that they are serving the need for which they have been created. Um, a couple more examples from the United States and from Britain as well. Uh, accessible parking spaces as close to the entrance as possible. And again, uh, a sloped entrance to the building, which um, offers equal access to everyone, to pedestrians, to people using wheelchairs, to uh, people accompanying children uh, in strollers, for example. Um, so these solutions accommodate everyone and make the venue or a building or a place, um, again, friendly and accessible to all. Um, of course, accessibility is then should be then um, ensured uh, within the premises, inside the building, and uh, often it requires installation of specific equipment like lifts or lifting platforms. Um, of course, there are regulations concerning those um, appliances as well, and again, they should be thoroughly followed so that the equipment is functional and uh, which is very important, safe. Um, also use of automatic doors or um, power doors is encouraged wherever possible. We should make sure that uh, little effort is required to enter a building or to use any particular equipment. Um, lifting platforms um, have different, um, let's say, maybe may be different in terms of their uh, operation, uh, there are lifting platforms that move vertically, then there are lifting platforms like these ones that are installed on the stairs and they are basically moving parallel in parallel to the stairs. Uh, both types are totally fine. It's just our, um, let's say, uh, our thinking, our 
approach um, defines what option is best for us or is best for this particular building setting or premises. So every time we think about accessibility, we must be um, conscious of the various, um, let's say, scenarios or use scenarios probably that uh, will be um, well, that will take place in a particular space. And uh, when we think about these scenarios, we then try to think which option would be best for us, which would work better, and which would be more safe, more uh, inclusive again. And of course, maintenance is also important. We should uh, think ahead about how shall we, um, how will we ensure that these devices are operating properly, not broken, not out of order. Uh, because any device that's out of order, of course, is basically a barrier to uh, people who need to use it. Um, accessibility is also um, an important feature for buildings or structures where we hold um, performances or other public events like lectures or um, theater again, performances uh, where there is a stage. Uh, so any hall, any auditorium should be um, improved to ensure um, accessibility. And this uh, means uh, ensuring that there is a accessible entrance, that there are particular spaces within the auditorium uh, that allow for you know, seating of people uh, who use wheelchairs and of course other audience members, such seats should be distributed uh, around the um, around the hall, around the auditorium, and they not should be they should not be grouped in one place, creating this sort of ghetto for uh, people with disabilities. Rather, we should think about distributing distributing them uh, around the area and, and uh, making sure that there is a choice uh, for people with disabilities. Mm, that they can make um, you know, according to their preferences um, regarding where they want to sit. To sit. Um, examples of such accommodations are um, given on these photos. Um, there are different options uh, that can be explored, uh, spaces that are um, envisaged for wheelchair users, um, maybe um, created initially when the building is uh, built. Uh, of course, uh, accommodations may be provided afterwards, um, like a retrofitting uh, option where, when we have a number of seats that can be just um, taken away. Uh, and uh, again, we are creating spaces that can be occupied by people using wheelchairs, for example. Um, Another important issue is providing accessibility information, like this example from the uh, New York City Museum, which uh, is a basically a plan of the ground floor. And uh, the plan provides the users with information on accessibility. You can see that there are accessible elevators. There is um, info about where the accessible restroom is located. So when a person is um, uh, moving around the building or planning a visit, uh, the person can um, initially understand uh, what awaits for him or her. And uh, again, make sure that or be convinced that the experience will be uh, comfortable and that the experience will be a, a nice one um, so that no unexpected situations arise. Uh, another issue which is kind of uh, more or less innovative in terms of um, general practices is this um, sensory friendly map um, option. Uh, sensory friendly map basically shows uh, which areas of the building or of the institution of the exhibition uh, are, um, let's say, high sensory, low sensory, or neither high or nor low sensory. This information is very important for uh, people with autistic disorders, uh, for some people with um, mental disabilities. 
and this is a quite new thing so i haven't seen um, such maps in ukraine not yet but i hope that in due time we'll also be thinking about um, the need to inform our visitors uh, about these sensory uh, issues so again uh, planning um, to to ensure that planning is appropriate and that the caregivers or parents are well informed on uh, which areas pose uh, risks for example or um, require special attention um next up is the yeah um of course we should provide accessibility in terms of horizontal cir circulation so that people can move around freely have access to the uh, exhibition and this requires uh, not just um, creating wide uh, walkways, but also ensuring that uh, all exhibits are mm, in place, uh, which is accessible for everyone, including children, including people in wheelchairs, including uh, everybody, um, basically, because pe all people are different. And um, again, disability is not always visible. So when we're designing um, any space, we should uh, keep that in mind. And there are guidelines, for example, on the left, this um, low quality picture is taken from the Smithsonian guidelines. And the guidelines on accessibility of exhibitions is something that's also developing. I know that this Smithsonian institution uh, is now updating those guidelines. But again, um, if you Google um, exhibition accessibility or museum accessibility, you may find um, various research and, uh, again, guides on how to do that uh, from different countries. Um, of course, there are certain requirements for placing particular um, exhibits like paintings, uh, and there is um, generally the consideration of physiology so the height of a person, um, a person that's standing, a person that's sitting uh, is uh, quite a simple requirement. And um, if we know that height, we can understand that the exhibits should be put uh, at the height of like a meter and a half, between a meter and a half and two meters. And that way uh, we make sure that the painting, for example, in this case, uh, can be seen, can be enjoyed by everybody. Mm, so again, it's nothing. Um, nothing here is like astrophysics. It's very simple stuff, but it requires um, just considering it at the right point. Um, disability also implies creating spaces that are friendly to everyone, that enable people to have a rest. For example, uh, this photo shows a bench. But this is, uh, it's not just a bench. It's a bench that is designed uh, to be convenient, for example, for people, um, for children, like we see in the picture, and also for elderly, because it has those armrests, which um, ensure that seating and standing up is um, effortless and is comfortable. So again, it just requires um, considering these issues during the design process. Uh, we also have to provide information for orientation or navigation uh, throughout the premises so that people are always at all times aware uh, on where our various um, amenities are located, where um, they can find the restroom or the wardrobe or where the exit is, so on and so forth. It can be done in a variety of ways. It's uh, all about design. It's all about um, making sure that all the inscriptions are um, made with contrast and that they are well uh, visible. Uh, so basically it's about designing um, proper uh, information signs and uh, directories or floor plans uh, again, this is very important in terms of orientation and navigation around buildings. Uh, 
One of the most important issues, of course, is the restroom, which uh, should be accessible. At least uh, we must provide an accessible bathroom, um, at least one accessible bathroom uh, in the building. And uh, there are particular requirements um, concerning the, mm, let's say, equipment that must be put in place and uh, how the space must be organized. Uh, handrails, height of the sink, height of the soap dispenser. And uh, if you look closely, you can see this red, uh, red wire hanging from the ceiling with uh, those red circles, handles. This is an emergency wire. So in case a person feels, um, feels some sort of um, unwell, let's say, or if a person falls, um, this enables uh, him or her to call for help. And uh, this is also a safety feature. Um, again, all these requirements are um, uh, probably always included in the regulations that are in place in every country um, or international standards uh, that apply. Um, accessibility may be um, ensured in a variety of ways, as I've said. And for example, the Neanderthal Museum in Germany uh, has this uh, particular infographics on their website, um, which informs people uh, about the accessibility features that are put in place in the museum. This is also uh, a very important issue to give out this information so that people can plan their visits and that they can anticipate the um, accessible features or lack thereof so that uh, the person knows uh, that, for example, the venue has no accessible bathroom, okay, then the, then it enables the person to plan ahead and think about uh, what will be done, what, what he or she will do in case uh, he or she needs to use the bathroom. Um, information is um, empowering, and this is a simple thing to do. So, um, even if accessibility is not fully provided, uh, we should always let people know about this. Uh, and from the same Neanderthal Museum in Germany, just an example of um, tactile surface indicators that uh, allow for uh, unobstructed and barrier-free movement for people um, with visual impairments, people who use canes. Um, Again, this is a design feature which can be uh, retrofitted. That means uh, installed after the building is complete or in case of older buildings. Uh, of course, it is better to um, think about these features um, when we have a new construction or a reconstruction, recon reconstruction so that these features are put in place uh, um, uh, in, a, in a timely fashion. Uh, next, uh, accessibility also, as we've mentioned, implies independent use. And independent use means that people should be able to move around the premises and enjoy, enjoy our venue, our exhibition by themselves without asking for additional help or assistance. Uh, for example, use of tactile signage uh, is one such feature. On the right, you can see a tactile floor plan, which is also, uh, which works perfectly fine for both people uh, with and without visual visual impairments. Um, this also requires just consideration, and um, then you order uh, the design and you order the the manufacturing of such um, signage elements and you install them according to the regulations. Uh, independent use also may imply um, modern technologies, for example, those sensory screens that are often put in place in museums. Uh, they provide a um, really interactive experience for the users uh, to learn, to find out more about the exhibition, to have a better look at the exhibits. Again, such screens or uh, such pieces of equipment should be installed in a way that is accessible to everybody. 
elderly, people using wheelchairs, people standing, children, everyone. Um, multiple formats uh, is also a feature of accessibility, and we've already mentioned uh, features that um, enable people with visual impairments to uh, enjoy uh, exhibits. This is done primarily through creation of tactile exhibits. So um, any 2D, two-dimensional exhibits may be turned into three-dimensional ones so that people can experience them by touch. Uh, this also works great for children, mm, not just people with disabilities or children with disabilities, uh, but uh, children who don't have disabilities uh, all, always enjoy uh, touching stuff. And uh, for them, uh, this tactile contact is um, essential. So um, I encourage everyone to think about creating tactile copies of um, any exhibit that you have. Um, again, tactile uh, copies in this case of famous paintings. This is in Madrid, uh, the Prada Museum. Um, how do we make how do we make uh, the um, most prominent paintings, um, let's say, accessible or seen by people who lost their um, vision? Uh, we make those copies that enable them to experience the painting by touch. And of course, uh, the paintings are accompanied by descriptions made in Braille so that people can read about the author, um, about the story of the painting, or how it was created, or what techniques have been used, so on. Um, another um, modern day example of uh, technological advance in terms of accessibility uh, is the audio guide. Uh, the audio guides are now very popular and provided in many, many venues. Um, not in not just indoor venues, but also in outdoor uh, places. Um, again, this is a, this is something that can be developed. Uh, this example in particular is from the Andy Warhol Museum in Pittsburgh, the United States, and uh, it enables people with uh, vision loss to uh, to learn about Warhol, about his career, about his um, creative heritage. Um, but I guess such examples are um, can be found in many, many countries, in many, many uh, venues. Uh, when we talk about performances, uh, it is uh, primarily, for example, cinemas or theater. Um, again, there are a lot of ways to make theater and a movie, a movie accessible to everyone. Um, for example, installation of a hearing loop, which enables people with hearing disability to, um, and people who use uh, hearing aids to have a better, um, let's say, it enables basically them to hear uh, what is happening. Then we have the audio description, which is now also available in, uh, for example, many streaming platforms or video uh, platforms in the web. Uh, of course, there is the sign language translation, which is which may be provided as a way to make a performance accessible. Uh, there are many uh, mobile applications that enable uh, visitors um, in the auditorium to use their smartphones and read the, um, the subtitles uh, from their screens. So it's all about, again, learning about the existing technologies and apply, in applying them accordingly. Um, representation is, uh, again, a very important feature or a very important principle. Uh, it basically means mainstreaming diversity through various media in culture and arts. Uh, here I've selected several uh, examples of uh, this mainstreaming uh, in the movies, uh, just not to, but, but of course many examples can be found in um, paintings, in the visual arts, in theaters, so everywhere across the cultural field, uh, diversity can be found. But movies are probably the most, um, let's say, massively consumed media product. And uh, one of the examples is the movie called Rain Man. Maybe you've heard of it, of it or somebody might have even seen it. Um, 
it basically depicts the story of uh, two brothers, one of which has um, uh, autistic spectrum disorder. And uh, this movie was uh, one of the, it basically caused a small revolution in terms of how people um, see uh, people with uh, people living with autism and uh, such movies change the perception within the society. So it's very important that um, the modern day cultural products uh, reflect um, the diversity and the variety of people um, in in a positive, uh, in a meaningful way. Another example is this movie. It's called One Plus One, I guess in French, but in the English version, it's called The Untouchables. Uh, it's a story of, um, well, you should see the movie, but again, it depicts uh, relation, re relations between two people uh, one with disability and um, the other without. Lastly, I want to mention this movie, which is one of the latest examples. It's uh, on Netflix. It's called All the Light We Cannot See. And it's about uh, the World War II. Uh, again, I'm not going to tell the, the, the storyline, but what is important is that uh, the central figure uh, in the movie is a uh, um, visually impaired uh, young girl, young woman, and um, the actress who played this um, this character uh, has a genetic disorder, um, which makes her actually uh, a person with disability. And um, her name is Aria, uh, Aria Mia Loberti. And <clears throat> on the right, you can see her at some festival with her friend. Again, um, uh, an actress with disability is um, one of the central figures in the movie. And it's something that uh, I guess can be hardly imagined like 20 years ago. It would be just um, something extraordinary. Now it's part of the new uh, new normal, which is great. Uh, another um, like example of mainstreaming diversity through art is the um, art brood. Um, let's say Art Brut is a um, particular field of art which um, basically uh, includes um, visual and other um, creations made by people without professional um, artistic education, including people with mental uh, disabilities, including people with a particular let's say hardships in their life hardships like people from disadvantaged backgrounds and so on and so forth and uh, this can be um, this uh, topic can be explored uh, thanks to various resources like the one uh, on this slide it's the collection in Lausanne there's a huge museum dedicated to art brood and uh, another example is the Henry Boxer Gallery which uh, provides an online archive of works created by um, so-called outsider artists. Um, again, this is something that is uh, that, that is of particular interest in terms of um, visual arts uh, and uh, cultural studies and um, something on the intersection of culture, social issues. Um, so I recommend uh, everyone to just get acquainted with this. Uh, participation uh, means that we should um, provide for sustainable and meaningful engagement of people with disabilities, like in this example from the Warhol Museum, again, which um, organized a sensory-friendly morning workshop program for youth and for uh, young adults. Um, they, the, the workshops are conducted during um, the uh, during those hours when the museum is not open for the general public so that they can ensure that um, people with sensory sensitivities can have their own way around the museum and they organize uh, special sessions where they can try, um, try themselves um, the various techniques that Warhol used in his um paintings and uh, designs and so on so again this is about including particular group 
um, that has a particular sensitivity to uh, those uh, sensory, um, let's say, sens sensory impacts. Um, another example, uh, which is also quite common in terms of the format, an inclusive theater group. There are theater groups, there are inclusive theater groups in many countries. This one is in Britain, it's called Mind the Gap, and it offers professional training and uh, performance opportunities to um, different people, including people with disabilities, uh, primarily people with uh, learning disabilities, uh, so that they can um, realize themselves as actors, as performers. Um, and this is a, a great example of, um, of, of social inclusion and uh, self-realization um, in a meaningful and engaging way. Um, to finish uh, my short, I hope, presentation, I would like to um, tell you about my project that I carried out thanks to the Eastern Partnership Civil Society Facility um, Fellowship. Uh, I've uh, been working on creation of a concise guide to inclusive art practices in Ukraine. And uh, this guide basically features um, studios, artistic studios, um, non-governmental organizations, and uh, even individual artists who, um, in a variety of ways, um, create those inclusive opportunities, engage youth and adults with disabilities into art. And um, basically, these are um, elements from the guide itself. So different techniques, different organizations from different cities all over Ukraine. Um, you can learn about this in the guide itself. And um, this is, for example, a studio in Viv, which uh, works with children uh, who have uh, Down syndrome or intellectual disabilities. And uh, their works are fantastic and uh, just extraordinary. And the important thing about uh, this particular studio and other studios, for example, uh, as well, um, is that the focus is never on the disability. The focus is never on the uh, peculiarity of a particular uh, painter or artist, the focus uh, is and should be on the art itself, on the creation, on the extraordinary value that it has uh, just because it's created by, uh, uh, by an individual. You can download the guide using this uh, QR code. It's um, bilingual, it's in Ukrainian and in English. It has all the uh, information in case you want to contact one of the organizations or just share some thoughts with them or engage in some partnership cooperation because this is the one of the objectives that I've been trying to um, attain uh, so that people different people know about uh, the Ukrainian experiences in inclusive artistic practices. Uh, that concludes my presentation. Uh, I'm grateful for your attention. I'm um, giving the floor to Katie. If you have any questions, um, please use chat if there are questions. Uh, but um, again, thank you very much for joining us. And Katie, please. Okay, um, I'm Katie Van Fildiani, and today I'm going to um, speak about Georgian context. Um, I'm Katie Van Fildiani, Projects Mentor at non-governmental organization uh, called uh, De Development and Engagement Platform. Uh, the organization was founded in 2019. Uh, the Development and Engagement Platform aims to advocate for gender equality, promote an inclusive environment, and raise awareness of the socio-political inclusion inclusion of vulnerable groups. Our mission is to empower society through skills development. Um, so today I'm going to talk about um, uh, best practice from Georgia. Uh, so about inclusive projects, very successful in inclusive projects in Georgia, inclusive arts organizations working um, in Georgia, about the barriers what um, like people with disabilities face every, in everyday life in Georgia, and about my project, um, and also about uh, future plans. 
Uh, so, uh, before joining Development Engagement Platform, I was working uh, with the British Council in Georgia, and I was coordinating various projects um, in the Department of Arts and Culture. And one of the most important projects uh, we've um, implemented uh, was called Unlimited Making the Right Moves. And um, I'm going to talk about the project in details. Uh, so, after um, uh, the British Council in Georgia, I I joined LEPL Creative Georgia, which is a legal entity of public law, and it is operating under the umbrella of the Ministry of Culture, Sports and Youth of Georgia. I was coordinating a very important project, um, uh, which was supported by the uh, British Council of Georgia. Um, the name of the project was Supporting Inclusivity in Culture. Um, and we worked with um, uh, UK expert Zoe Partington. Um, and currently, I'm um, Easter Partnership Civil Society Fellow, and I'm working on my project, Fostering Engagement of Youth with Disabilities in Arts and Culture. Uh, so um, now I'm going to talk about uh, the British Council's very important project, uh, which was implemented in Georgia. So it was unlimited making the right moves. It was an arts and disability program arising from a common sense idea that there are no limits for those who dream big, regardless of background and physical ability. Uh, the program included workshops, educational forums, and live performances since its, uh, since its um, inception in 2015 uh, as a British Council program. It had a significant effect on the arts and theatre scene and on the lives of disabled people living in the region. As for Georgia, uh, so in Georgia it had uh, great achievements, like it became an inspiration for the creation of Tbilisi Inclusive Dance Company. Georgian dancers participated in the creative process of the Orgonauts, the joint international dance performance created by Ben Duke, a choreographer from the UK. The performance was successfully premiered at UK Georgia 2019. And also the forum at the Parliament of Georgia. Uh, so it was international unlimited forum. Uh, and it happened for the first time in Georgia in history that the Georgian Parliament um, hosted the international forum. Uh, so feedback from the event was very positive with 100% uh, of 39 respondents indicating that their understanding of disability inclusive arts had developed positively and that they were are more likely to explore disability arts and culture as a result of attending the forum. So um, now, um, where did it start? Um, so in Georgia, the Unlimited Making the Right Moves program started in September 2017. It was actually a four-year program. And um, so um, it is um, already finished, but I hope that it will continue in future as well. Um, so uh, first, it started with uh, venue audits for accessibility. Where, um, and uh, uh, so um, um, these um, like, uh, audits were conducted two um, state um, theaters in Georgia, Rustaveli and Marjanishvili uh, theaters uh, by Barbara Lisicki. Um, she's a trainer from Shape Arts, a UK-based disabled-led arts organization. And Ms. Lisicki then uh, led a workshop on theater accessibility for theater professionals. Uh, in September, Deaf Man Dancing, uh, the all-male deaf dance company gave a performance of its new outdoor piece entitled 10 at uh, Tbilisi International uh, Festival of Theatre. Uh, with the support and cooperation of um, Marjanishvili Drama Theatre, November brought the Kanduko Company and Dancer Dance Lab One uh, for Georgian dancers interested in inclusive dance. And in 2018, uh, we had Dance Lab Two by Kanduko. And um, so I, I attended all the, uh, like all these um, uh, workshops and it was very interesting all non-professional, professional, disabled and non-disabled artists were involved in the um, workshops and um, like they were very much interested and um, like it was very um, like um, um, successful workshops. Um, so um, then um, the most important thing was in September 8, uh, 2018, when British Council supported Tbilisi Inclusive Dance Company uh, to perform at Tbilisi. 
uh, international theater festival theater uh, theater fe uh, festival sorry uh, the company presented its first performance the other way as part of georgian showcase and in november 2018 in partnership with the ministry of education science culture and sport of georgia the british council invited tim wheeler uk expert for a consultancy visit he conducted an inclusive art project design training for um and with the disability art community in georgia so then we had UK season in Georgia and it was a very important project. Um, so in 2019, um, uh, the British Council in Georgia with collaboration um, with the UK Embassy in Georgia implemented the project UK season. Uh, the UK season in Georgia was a carefully curated program of 60 plus events in three months. So I remember it was very difficult actually to do and to implement 60 plus activities in three months, but but it was an unforgettable experience. Um, so the season ran from September to December 2019 and included events in Tbilisi, Batumi, Kutaisi and other locations across Georgia. The UK season showcased the best that modern, diverse, global Britain has to offer, including in culture, sport, education and business. So the season also highlighted the strengths of the UK-Georgia friendship and um, uh, Unlimited making the right move was also uh, included um, in uh, the project. Uh, and in the season, uh, so and uh, in collaboration with Lost Dog and uh, with the support of the British Council, presented the Argonauts, the culmination of four year program. So with the Argonauts, the unlimited program showcased how 10 professional and non-professional disabled and non-disabled performers from different countries can work together. And so uh, there we are like uh, uh, Georgian dancers um, and dancers from Ukraine, uh, Azerbaijan, Armenia, uh, uh, dancing together. Uh, so uh, professionals, um, this uh, kind of performance was produced in just 20 days during three residencies held in Kyiv between June and September 2019. So the Argonauts is the creation of Lost Dogs artistic director, Ben Duke, working in collaboration with artists Wally O'Brien and Jemima Hodley and producer Ellie Douglas Allen of Kanduko uh, Dance Company. The Argonauts premiered on 25th of September in Tbilisi. Uh, so, and as part of the UK season in partnership with uh, Tbilisi International Festival of Theatre, British Council presented Kenduko and uh, its um, the two performances, uh, Face In, choreographed by Yasmin Goddard, and Let's Talk About This. So, and um, the last um, uh, and very important event was at Parliament of Georgia uh, Disability Arts Forum, which aimed to raise awareness within governments, arts practitioners, and the general public about the economic, social, and cultural benefits of disability arts practice, inclusion, and making arts and culture productions and venues accessible for disabled artists. So, and the last performance also, uh, which was uh, shown on Tbilisi International Festival of Theatre, it was 111, a powerful duet between two exceptional dancers, Joel Brown and Eve Mutso. So you can see on the picture, and so the second picture is uh, like Joel Brown and Eve Mutso. So Joel is a wheelchair user and like amazing dancer. So it was like unforgettable um, performance. Uh, so, um, and uh, Eve Mutso, she's former principal dancer with the Scottish Ballet. Uh, so uh, the next project and very important project was um, implemented by Creative Georgia in 2021 with the support of the British Council in Georgia and the goal of the project was to support and to promote inclusivity in arts and culture in Georgia and to raise awareness of its role in uh, the social and economic development of the country. Uh, so the UK expert in disability, Zoe Partington, carried out meetings with uh, government representatives, cultural organizations and NGOs. 
So, and uh, the project uh, involved the creation of a special recommendation document regarding inclusion issues in the management of cultural events. So Zoe Partington had um, all the meetings with different sector representatives, and then finally she created their recommendations. Um, so, uh, and uh, this is very important document because it's um, um, it developed taking into account the best UK experience and also the objectives of long-term cultural strategy, cultural strategy 2025, and the analysis of the local context. Uh, so um, uh, now I'm going uh, to talk about um, the arts organizations, which um, which we have, sorry, which we have in Georgia. Uh, so, and um, it's integrated theater as Ducks Garden, Free Space Batumi, Anisi Inform, Batumi Inclusive Theater, and Georgian a National uh, Wheelchair Dance Sport Federation. Uh, so before we move, I have a question uh, to uh, the participants of the webinar in order to um, make some discussions and uh, to also um, hear your opinion. I would like you uh, to think about uh, unforgettable accessible event for you, so which you have seen so far and uh, why it was impressive for you. So you can use uh, the chat or you can raise hand also and um, like talk directly. Of course, you will have time for this but it would be amazing to hear from you as well what which is the like which is unforgettable accessible um event for you that you have seen um, so far um now i continue talking and um I, i'll be happy to see your comments and um, thoughts uh, in the chat um so now i'm going to start with um integrated um, the theater as Ducks Garden. So it's um, like very important theater in Georgia. And uh, I've also attended their performances and uh, like um, um, like non-disabled and disabled artists, they are like amazing. So artistic director and director of the integrated theater as Ducks Garden, Ivane Bacho Gabrashvili worked as a drama therapist in rehabilitation and daycare centers with disabled people. And he came uh, with an idea to establish integrated theater where people with disabilities and professional actors would play on the same stage. So thus in March 2016, him, the integrated theater as Dax Garden was founded. The goal of the integrated theater is to let people with disabilities interested in theater to try themselves as actors, stand next, next to professional actors and generate income from doing what they like. All this makes them more independent, increases their self-esteem and makes their life better, which is the most important thing. So based on the extraordinary idea of um, uh, the director, Bajo Gaburashvili, disabled the puppets were created. So on the pictures, you can see disabled puppets and it's like a really amazing because it's the first time I think um, such kind of puppets were created. Mm. So the goal of the theater is also to introduce inclusive education at schools. So children from school age have knowledge about inclusion and interact with people with disabilities. In order to reach this goal, as Dax Garden actors will collaborate with the schools and students and carry out workshops. The pilot training was successfully conducted at school uh, Iveria, and I hope that uh, this continues because it's really important for, uh, for children uh, from kindergarten or even from school to have communication with uh, people with disabilities and um, to even collaborate with them. Uh, so um, then we have free space Batumi. Uh, so um, Batumi is a city in the uh, southwestern part of Georgia and so social enterprise Free Space was founded in 2017. The company's mission is to create an inclusive and accessible space model that is as close as possible to universal design. The main idea during creation was to create a space in Batumi that would be a favorite and comfortable meeting place for everyone. So free space by its name reminds us that it is an empty environment everyone, including people with disabilities, can independently visit or even get employed in this cafe. In 2016, there was a shortage of adapted public gathering places in Batumi. That's why with the help of Batumi City Hall Real Friends enthusiasts such kind of space was created, which was initially only used as a meeting place. 
but after winning the Social Enterprise Grant Competition of CSRDG in 2017, it is um, it um, got the status of a social enterprise. Since its establishment, the free space has given about 40 young people, among them about 20 people with disabilities, the opportunity to work, to try their own strength, and moreover, to move to work in a larger enterprise with the skills required. So um, here on the screen, you can uh, see how many activities uh, the space has already implemented. So like they are very, really successful, uh, successfully working in Georgia. Um, so um, the next um, organization I'm going to talk is ANISI, the Integrated Desk School Studio, uh, which was founded in 2021. Since its uh, establishment, the first branch has been working on the basis of Shota Rustavelli State University of Theatre and Cinema. It should be noted uh, that choreographic students are actively involved in the educational process uh, and along with the students with disability, so like they are both like uh, non-disabled and disabled um, uh, students um, involved in um, Anisi's life 